Good evening. Welcome to live stream at Upper Room. I'm Ron Strand. Welcome to this Monday, March 1st, 2021. We're glad that you're joining us. And as others are logging on, we'll kind of get some little housekeeping business out of the way. We're glad that you're here tonight. And uh, we have got our part two interview tonight with Dr. Greg Reed. And uh, if you were with us last week, you heard his testimony, amazing, riveting testimony. And we're going we're gonna to recap some of that tonight. And we're also going to go a little more in depth in some other subjects. And so tonight's going to be a great night. We want to take your questions. So even if you have a question now, go ahead and type it in. And uh, we're going to do our best to get to it um, and ask Greg anything you want. And, uh, and we're going to try to get to those questions. So if you don't know who The Upper Room is, we are doing a once a week live stream. We've been doing this for, well, almost a year now. Next month, it'll be a year. Uh, and we started it when COVID hit and we could no longer do our monthly in-person meetings where we have, uh, where, where we are a ministry kind of where culture and uh, entertainment meet ministry. Uh, we have uh, musical artists that come in. Uh, we have comedians, we have speakers of note and uh, we're a ministry outside the walls of the church. We are a 501c3. We depend on donations from folks like you, but we're not going to hit you up for that. But if you feel like <laughs> donating to us, there'll be some stuff at the end of the evening tonight where you could where you can donate. But it's not about that tonight. We just want to present to you some outstanding folks in the Christian community. And that's what we've been doing. And if you want to go back and look at some of our past interviews, just go to our Facebook page where you're probably at right now, which is The Upper Room Presents. You could also go and find them on YouTube, which is also found under The Upper Room Presents. If you want to find out more about our ministry, check out our website at theupperroompresents.com. There it is, theupperroompresents.com. And uh, like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube page. You'll be notified every time uh, something comes up and uh, you can watch one of our great uh, interviews. Next week, we're pleased to announce that we're going to be having... Uh, uh, <laughs> John Michael Talbot is going to be our guest next week. Uh, wonderfully uh, uh, singer-songwriter. Um, and uh, those of you who have been around the Christian uh, church for the last 30, 40 years, you'll know who John Michael Talbot is, a wonderful troubadour. And uh, we're going to go in depth with him. So we're excited about that. Um, again, I think I already mentioned if you have some questions, uh, just start writing those in now. But we're not going to waste any more time with that. We're going to get right to our guest. Again, let me give you a little recap of who Greg Reed is. Greg is a writer, an author. He's a national speaker. He speaks all over the U.S. He's also an experienced uh, criminal justice trainer and um, uh, investigator that uh, helps, the, have, helps law enforcement investigate the occult and crimes against children. Um, he's been in youth, youth ministry since 1975. He's a graduate of Christ for the Nations uh, School in Dallas, and he holds a honorary doctorate from Logos Graduate School, and he's an ordained minister with the American Evangelistic Association. Uh, he is the director of Youth Fire Ministry. We'll put that website up there for you, too, because you want to go check out uh, Greg's uh, ministry page. That's Youth Fire Ministry. And uh, we're going to welcome him back again. So welcome, uh, Greg Reed, everyone. Hi, Greg. Thank you, Ron. It's good to see you. How are you? Good to see you. I'm well, thank you. How are you doing out there? Just doing great. South Texas, border town, huh? West Texas. We're West the, Texas. Very West Texas. tip. Very tip. Down in the Mexico West Texas. Mexico. Yeah. yeah. The West Texas town of El Paso. Yeah. I fell in love with a Mexican girl. Is that wrong to say? <laughs> Uh, well, probably now. Probably. You know, yeah, you can't do anything there. now. <laughs> yeah, no, but we can take you to Rosie's Cantina. It's a real Yeah, place you up. did mention that, that there actually is a Rosie's Cantina. Yeah, it's a biker bar now. Is it really? So that was a song, was that Marty Robbins song, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, I think it was his only hit, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> well, we are gonna, we're going to recap some stuff that we talked about last week, and um, uh Let's let's give the folks just kind of a thumbnail, if you can, of 
your past, maybe within a kind of a five minute, and, and then I'll, I, I want to kind of follow up on some of the the things that you had talked about. But um, sure, you bet. Am I throwing you to the lions there by saying that? Is that okay? No, that's great. Yeah, no, okay. that's good. Good. Yeah, no, the 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 Cliff Notes version is. I grew up in your neck of the woods, Southern California, San, San Fernando Valley. My dad was a cop. My mom was, uh, you know, housekeeper. She was, she was our mom. And um, we, it was kind of a leave it to beaver type of existence in a lot of ways. It was very yeah. safe in a lot of ways, except for some children like myself that had been, uh, because of our family lineage and some kind of a crime of opportunity, I suppose they were able to latch on to me at a young age and involve me in um, rituals that had to do with uh, satanic type of uh, themes, occult themes, also involved in child pornography as a young child. And um, basically just scrambled everything in my life. So by the time I was 11, I was hardly even functional. You know, people talk about dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality, whatever. I wasn't that, but I was just totally fragmented in other ways. And I went from being, you know, good student, good kid. to I just went totally south and I began to uh, plunge into the occult very heavily. And by the time I was 14, I was essentially drinking myself to death and um, recruiting other kids into the occult. And uh, by a miraculous intervention by Jesus Christ, uh, who was the last person I was looking for. I thought he was probably a good man, but, you know, so was Buddha and so was, you know, Krishna and all this. Wasn't looking for him, but he was looking for me and he came and he rescued me. And uh, I've stayed rescued all these years. You've stayed rescued and you've yeah. and you've uh, influenced others for Christ. And what a, what an amazing story. I want to delve a little bit into the, the family history, if you will, um, because in your book, um, Nobody's Angel, you talk about your, uh, I believe it's your maternal grandparents who were, you You called them wild partiers or uh, in, they came into money. It, explain that and explain how that related into, um, um, you know, the abuse and so forth. Well, uh, we were Mormon dynasty. Our family goes back to the founding of uh, Nephi, Utah, my great, great, great grandfather's yeah. foot. And so my whole family lineage was Mormon, but my grandparents kind of rebelled. I don't know where my grandpa really got off on other things, but his father helped to found the town of Cripple Creek, Colorado. No kidding. And so he inherited a lot of money from his dad. And so my grandpa and grandma got married, had my mother and my uncle, and they just abandoned them basically when they were little kids, two and three years old, and uh, went and partied and lost all the money. And my grandpa moved one place. My grandma moved to Pasadena, California, was a wild, wild drunk. And, uh, you know, she came to know Jesus before she died, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. But she was a wild lady. She was known as a uh, somebody who was involved in what they called table tap tapping, which is it was kind of like a Ouija board, except they used a big table. And so... You know, I was born, so like second generation total wounding of a child. And because of there was a background in my family of some occult practices, um, I was kind of, when they're looking for children who can carry the power from generation to generation, then they look for a child like me. Normally they want a male child. And my guess is they probably would have used my uncle's children because my uncle was a very sad and wicked man. But uh, he had no sons. So I just think they took a right turn and found me. I was born on a holiday that was known as the, the Feast of the Wolves. And um, so it was kind of like, as they would say, all the stars were in alignment. I was available. My parents were just disconnected enough that they could take me out of their care without my parents really knowing uh, that there was anything wrong. And so I was. it was a perfect setup for me and other children. Uh, my best friend, Mark, was one of those children. But he was born into it. Uh, he, didn't, he never knew anything else. And so really? they kind of connected, he and I. His job, I think, was to kind of invite me to things, get me involved in their family, keep an eye on me. 
um, go with me to some of these ritual activities. And eventually, you know, they extinguished his life. Yeah, which is a tragic story and, and that you go about, that you talk about in your book. And um, so your grandmother was actually involved in uh, the ritualistic abuse. Was she, was she, is, is that what I'm understanding or was no, she? No, nobody in my family, as far as I know, was directly involved. It was, okay. my uncle was married to some of you old enough to remember Steve Allen, the comedian. Sure. Uh, my uncle's married to Steve Allen's first wife. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And so I grew up with Steve's boys. You know, we were kind of mixing match. They'd come oh, yeah. with us. We'd go to Steve's house. But somewhere in that mix, I think, is probably with the Hollywood crowd where someone uh, was able to reach into that open door through my uncle and, and gain access to me. Wow. Unbelievable. You write in the foreword of your book, um, Nobody's Angel, about your mother. And I want to kind of go into that. You said other memories, unfortunately, do not. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. This is another quote. Uh, you said, if mother knew anything, I believe she too was a victim. She was in more pain than anyone I've ever known. She numbed that pain with alcohol and nicotine that eventually took her life on the satanic holiday of St. Weinbald's Day, January 7th, 1994. So your mom you believe that she was victimized as well. Um, I've come to believe that she so yeah. now that I know all of the background of what happens to victims when they grow up, she, I have very little doubt that something of that nature happened with her. all the classic, uh, signs of, of that. Now, what, what I, um, there's a couple things that I want to, that I, I want to kind of delve into as well. Um, memories, uh, and uh, well, let's let's go on kind of with your family, and then we'll kind of come back to that. Yeah. Um, and uh, your dad was a was a police officer, LAPD. Um, but yet your parents were detached enough where they didn't they didn't see what was happening in your young life, where you were drifting off, or you were becoming a uh, an alcoholic, and you were attending these ritualistic, uh, satanic, uh, occultish um meetings and so forth yeah it's hard for people to understand that this was the 50s yeah and early 60s where you trusted your neighbors you right could leave them if you're if your child had a friend you could leave them there with their friend and their parents for a couple of days and nobody suspected anything it's only been in the last few decades that people have awakened to the fact that what can happen to a child when they're out of the care of their parents so to my parents it was just normal and natural and of course when you have a dad that's a cop he actually worked three jobs so we didn't see him a lot mom's trying yeah. to hold it together um i just slipped through the cracks and my dad yeah. i'll never forget sitting down with him in las vegas a year after my mom died and we met up there and sat in the little hotel at the uh el cortez and i said pop we need to talk and i thought he's either going to tell me i'm crazy or not and I'll never forget the look on his face was like all these pieces fitting together. And he just tears came out of his eyes. He said, son, I would have done anything to stop it if I wouldn't have known, if I would have known, I didn't know. And it was a real moment of healing for me, of course. And he was very helpful in trying to engage the help of LAPD in tracking down what happened to my friend. So. Wow. And did they ever find out anything about that or was it? They were not interested in really just two. Yeah. As, as a victim of, of, of abuse, like you were, um, and there's two parts of this that I, that I, I think I want to kind of go into because it's, I want to solidify it in my mind and maybe get the folks to solidify it. But, um, there's abuse that comes with that, but then you voluntarily, later become part of the occult and um, and engage in that. And it's a natural transition when you've been abused like that. But also uh, in your book, uh, Nobody's Angel, you say other memories, unfortunately, do not allow for any padding of romantic anesthesia. They are stark, clear, brutal, ugly, detailed, and permanent. How I wish they were modifi modifiable 
but they are not. One of the questions that I have with when, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what you mean by romantic anesthesia. Um, how does, how did the, the abuse and, and the, the ritualistic um, things that you were involved in, how has that affected you in your life with other relationships, with uh, romantic relationships and so forth? Well, it was pretty destructive when I was in my teenage years and I hadn't come to terms with uh, even a, even a small portion of what had happened. Um, and so once I actually started to process all of that and bring it to a point of healing, um, you know, all relationships were just like they were with everybody else. But in the beginning it was just like, and this happens with a lot of victims that just seal themselves off from the rest of the world. And there's the person that you see on the outside. And then there's a person that just, it's not going to let you anywhere near. And there were other people along the way that saw something was going on, but they were never able to actually get to it. And it really just took the hand of God to finally break down all those walls and get to everything that was just, uh, had been there since the very beginning. And their hopes, of course, when they do this to any child, and it's happened a lot over, and we've talked about a hundred different cases it's happened, in the United States, some of them were very public. Some of them were from the Los Angeles area. I'm talking about the McMart McMartin School, preschool. Oh, yeah. These children and myself, uh, you you grow up, and the hope of the other side is that you'll become a vessel that they can use. For example, when they use particularly a male child, there's a certain specific group of rituals they do to break them down so much that they can become an open door, what they call a magic mirror, that they can actually use that person as a demonic vessel to work rituals. And so those doors, if, if, I mean, if you come to Christ, those doors still have to be closed at some point. They don't automatically close. When you come to Jesus, there's a lot of damage done. Has that affected you? Uh, significantly over the years in in uh, close relationships uh, or letting others into your life or and so forth Is it did for many years yeah. yeah then the right people got in god brought the right people yeah brought, yeah brought the i right would imagine people. because it just damage it, it damages and touches every whit of your life absolutely and, uh, yeah, and so I can imagine that that all of that is is a part of the process of of healing and coming through that um, gosh, there's so many directions I want to go with this. Um, you mentioned the McMartin preschool, which was, a, yes, it was a very a highly publicized thing here in Southern California. It was a mother and her son that ran a preschool in Los Angeles out of their home. Um, help me understand and help the folks understand that what, what, do you recall what happened on that? Were they ever, um, uh, prosecuted and uh, uh, did they ever prove that or were they let off? I don't remember what they happened. were eventually let off the hook because what happened was, and I'm, I'm trying to write a book on all of this right now. And it's the toughest book I've ever written. And it'll probably be the most dangerous thing I've ever ventured to do because all of this broke open in the early eighties, mid eighties. We didn't know. I mean, I was in ministry by then. I was, you know, teaching at churches, doing different things. And then, see, with my background, I've always said, well, Lord, I've got this. If you ever want me to talk about all this cult stuff, I'm glad to. The Lord just said, no, I don't want you to do that. And then in 1986, it was like go time. Yeah. And I knew something was coming. And I moved from where I was in Fort Worth to where I'm at now. And I met with a lady who had got raised up her to start a ministry called the, Notch, the Watch Network because – the churches, youth groups, uh, law enforcement were getting flooded across the country with crimes dealing with the occult. And the Martin, Martin case was one of those. We had one here in El Paso at a daycare center, YMCA daycare center. And there was probably at least 10 that I know of nationally, all at the same time. None of it would communicate with each other. These children in these daycares started to disclose this awful stuff that had happened to them. Well, nobody knew what to do with it. Nobody ever heard. I mean, it's like, what are you talking about? The janitor dressed up like a werewolf. What are you talking about? They're killing bunnies. I mean, this totally took everybody off guard. 
So admittedly, they botched the McMartin case because they didn't know what they were dealing with, in addition to the fact that a lot of the actual evidence was never allowed in the courtroom. Now, a friend of mine, the late uh, 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 Ted Gunderson, who was the head of the uh, FBI in Los Angeles for quite a while, he later discovered that there were tunnels underneath the McMartin Preschool. That evidence was never found and never allowed. So oh they went through a national campaign. I mean, you would have to, to, to really have been there to understand. I hope be able to elucidate that in writing some point. At the same time, between 87 and 90, we were going across the country. We were training law enforcement, all over the country, probation classes, um, EMT workers, military, because everybody was having a problem with it, either from a teenage standpoint, children being abused, or outright criminal murder, uh, arsons, rapes, any number of things. As we were doing that, apparently there was a huge wave right behind us that was going to bury everything that we did and call it fraud and call it um, satanic panic, uh, village folklore. Uh, they used somebody that was with the FBI that crossed the country saying, I've never seen any evidence of this. This stuff is not real. And then we had an organization called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation that rose up and was being used in every courtroom. They would have somebody come in to say children are lying about being abused. And then they used a Christian organization out of the Midwest to write a series of articles to destroy the credibility of everybody they could that was fighting in this, in this fight. You can tell them a little passionate about it because we went from about 250 investigators uh, law enforcement, pastors, safe houses. By the time this campaign of disinformation was finished, we were down to about five people that even did this anymore. Unreal. Do you know if um, on that McMartin case, has there been any follow-up on the children? Because they would be young adults now, I would assume. Uh, do you know anything about that? All I can tell you is about probably eight or nine years after the case, I got a call in the middle of a night from about a 19 year old young man who was one of the Martin children. And somehow he got my number and he just called me in the middle of the night. He says, I can't make the memory stop. Oh he says, God. I don't know how to make the nightmares stop. So, you know, that was the one contact I had with the child who, you know, just was probably never going to be any better. And I imagine the rest of them are also, had uh, gone in that direction because, and when you have to disclose all this horrible stuff in court and then to be humiliated on the stand by defense lawyers, uh, you're never going to want to talk to anybody again and you'll never be normal unless God heals you. It's horrible what they did to those children. Oh, good Lord. And um, these people never served time. I think they served some. I'd have to go back through my notes, but I think they served a little bit of time and then they i think they were you know the case was overturned and that was that they both gone on to the rightful reward so yeah that. have they both uh, i imagine the mother's probably gone is the i son? think they're both gone yeah yeah well i won't even say what i wish upon them but you could imagine yes i can <laughs> how prevalent greg is this um you know, it's, I mean, I know it's out there. Uh, we've had it touch our family in, to some degree, not to the degree where you have, but, um, and it's not just the ritualistic, it's, it's, it's grandparents. I mean, you know, it could be, it could be family member. It could be, it, it's just so prevalent. And what are some of the signs that a parent should look for? Um, when some of these things happen, because we talked earlier about, you know, how your parents were just busy raising in the sick fifties and sixties, but, you know, I think parents are a little more, um, tuned into their kids today, particularly, uh, Christian families and Christians are not exempt uh, from this as we know. Um, but what are the things they should be looking for? You're going to want to look for a child who is uh, their behavior changes almost overnight. Uh, they go from being kind of just a normal kid and then they're angry. 
uh, withdrawn. Uh, if you see a child that is 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 developing, you know, their signs of being sexualized, that they suddenly take on a sexual component as a child, you're going to be really concerned about that because that's coming from somewhere. Um, grades plummeting, uh, withdrawing, sometimes cutting, is a sign that something's going on. Uh, toileting abnormalities. There's a number of things like that. Uh, terror and nightmares. Um, that's that's just a small handful of some of the signs. You see it if you see a constellation of those signs, you're going to want to dig deep and find out what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, this can happen as early as as adolescence, or um, and even into into teenhood or early teenhood, preteen, and. Um, well, I don't want to push the envelope too far on this, but I don't know, I'm going to try to put this in a way that's not going to completely just, you know, make people want to tune out completely. But when I learned, because I, at some point we went from investigating crimes of the occult to they were dovetailing into crimes of transporting, transporting children across the border. And we ran into two or three huge, massive cases of child abuse, child trading, child pornography, and one of the people who was the head of that group from Nebraska sang at the 1984 and the 1988 Republican National Convention. This one is of the, the one of the abusers, person that was running the, the international oh my gosh. And once I got in, I got involved in that case because I was I had somehow gotten involved with the, looking to see if we could find anything on the disappearance of Johnny Gosh, who was like the original poster boy who was, I think, uh, 13 or something when he was kidnapped just as a paper boy. They took him and he was never found. And we found some leads. And so we started going investigating that. I went to Nebraska and talked to some people because I'd learned that there was a whole ring of people internationally involved in this. And it just got outlandish. And so I, I knew I needed some boots on the ground training in some of this. So I had a friend who knew somebody in the police department that did training on um, crimes against children. I attended his classes. I got some really good understanding. This was, I think in 1990, he just looked me square in the face and said, and that was back then. He said, child pornography and child trading is a $15 billion a year industry. He says, there's not much you can't cover up with that kind of money. That was in 1990 by, by, I, I know by 2015, it was a $35 billion a year industry. And now it's probably tripled that. Um, so the scope of this thing is horrendous. And, and, and unfortunately, to find out all this stuff has to do with the deep web, there's no end to the depravity. But one of the things that's one of the things that sells the most on the Internet is the um, violation of infants. What does that mean? the filming and the, the violation, the rape of, of, of infant children. Oh, okay. They are, that's one of the things that people pay the most money to buy or to view. Uh, I can't even comprehend. I mean, the depth of evil has no end yes. in that, but if you can imagine a baby, if they survive that, they, when they grow up, all they will have is this pain and they'll have nothing to connect it with. And that's why the more I've learned about this, the more I've dedicated just everything I possibly can to, to, to stopping this and make these people account for what they've done and continue to do. There's a reason that Jesus said that if anyone harms a child, that a millstone would be tied around their neck and thrown into the deepest ocean. There's a reason that he said that. And, you know, I mean, I don't know. Well, there was ritualistic abuse in biblical times, for sure, um, but it's the most hideous, 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 or what is the word, crime against humanity to harm a child. And uh, well, I was going to say that goes right into abortion, you know, and and that's another one. But we'll keep it on 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 this tonight. Um, Talk, Greg, about how you got involved with with law enforcement and uh, and what you did with them and, and some of the cases maybe that you that you worked on with that. 
Yeah, you know, it was almost by default because when I was here at first working with this group, the Watch Network, we had our little, you know, podunk little slide presentation. We'd show symbols of the occult that you'd see in rock albums and stuff. And and then at some point there was a case from Beaumont Army Medical Center involving a, a military military policeman's daughter. So we had to go in and tell them what we knew and then learn some more. And then we were involved in a training with a man named Van McDonald, who was a really a legend in the FBI. And he uh, profiled a murder of a young, I believe, uh, 18-year-old girl in, in Odessa, Texas. And it was horrible. It was ritualistic. It's the worst thing I'd had to view at that point. Um, and I told my friend Sue, she was about 25 years older than me. And I looked at her in the class and I said, I'm going to go after this. I want to find out what happened there. And so I started to pursue that. And then it's just like one door. We got letters from a probation department. And Sue asked me if I'd go and, you know, train for them. And so I had no idea what I was doing. That's back when we didn't even have slides. We had overheads. And so I'm writing out all that I knew. I met some other people that been law enforcement who were getting on to this stuff. And the next thing you know, the doors open for me to train police academy in Colleen, Texas at Fort Hood. And that opened up the door to a national homicide conference. So I, I was in the advantage place that I, I was about 10 steps ahead of where law enforcement were at any given point. But that was just 10 steps ahead. I was having to learn and to process and to turn into uh, information that they could use. And by the end of the time when I was being called on, I think I've trained about 250 law enforcement and criminal justice settings uh, over the years, but I had uh, at least an, one eight hour block on occult crimes that was so difficult that some officers would just walk out. Or oh, they would, I can't imagine. They couldn't handle it because when you deal with children in this, no parent can hardly tolerate even hearing about it. Um, so that's how I kind of got involved in that line of work. And then, Somewhere maybe in the first five years, somebody, a friend of mine that had gotten a private investigator's license said, look, if you're going to do this work, you probably need some sort of protection. So they got me hooked up with an organization and I got a PI's license, which I had for several years. And, uh, you know, we just pursued from that end. And it's, it's stunning now because at some point in 2000, we'd lost most of the people we'd worked with through either retirement or burnout or, or dying or whatever. And I went and laid my head down at a nice church here in El Paso. I thought I just want a break. And um, it wasn't a break for very long, but learning now, of course, at this point, that all the things that we talked about, not only are still out there, but it's way beyond, uh, you deal with the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. You're talking about stuff we knew about back in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, but now it's coming to fruit and some of it is getting exposed. Most of it you're never going to see come to the light of day because it goes too deep. It goes too far up the totem pole of our government for it to really be exposed. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? One of the tricks of the trade, so to speak, in their world is um, they, if let's say there's a uh, somebody, let's just call it a county judge because I don't want to. You know, you can go up the ladder, whatever you want to talk, whatever position. Yeah. County judge that they know has a predilection for children, that they are a pedophile, they're a closet pedophile or whatever. They will arrange something, some sort of a party where that judge can be present. Um, and there'll be lots of drugs, alcohol, whatever. And they will compromise that judge with a child or at least with an underage teenager. And then, uh, you know, the judge is going to wonder what, the heck happened the next day, whatever, like a lot of people go to those parties. And then at some point they're going to be approached by somebody they know in private and saying, look, um, as long as you do what we tell you to do, uh, there won't be a problem. But if you fail to do what we need when we need it, we've got these. And then they'll show them all the pictures that they took or the video that they took of this activity. That judge is never going to turn on them ever. And there's a numerous people in political power that have been blackmailed and are going to make sure. I mean, if you look at the Jeffrey Epstein thing, that was a no brainer. When he got arrested, I told several friends, I said, they're going to suicide him. 
They will never let his little black book come out. And they did that. They suicided him. Somebody got a hold of the black book, and now they're looking at Ghislaine, Ma Ghislaine Maxwell. Well, I guarantee you she had her own little black book. She's in jail. She probably cut a deal, and all this goes away. And we've never heard about Jeffrey Epstein. Nobody talks about Michael Wein or uh, Harvey Weinstein anymore. Nobody talks about the Me Too movement because that's how they work. Well, we've certainly seen a lot of, of um, judicial strangeness, I guess you'd say, where you would think certain judges would stand up for certain things and they just don't. And I'm talking about in a lot of different things. Uh, and, it, and what you're saying really makes a lot of sense. Now, when you talk about these judges doing and they, and they um, compromise these judges, are these judges that have a proclivity toward this or are they just getting them to a party and um they, you know, from what i understand they have a, some sort of an idea that they're they're bent in that direction or at least that they're open to it it's just unbelievable it's unbelievable um wow um let's talk about Epstein and how do you say his girlfriend's name? Ghislaine Maxwell. Ghislaine Maxwell. She's in prison somewhere. Where she's not even really been tried yet, has she? She's just being held. Just being held. Um, why do you think she's not been, uh, as you said, uh, suicided? I think she cut a deal of some sort. Like I said, she probably had her own little black book. I'm just speculating, but if I understand the way these things work. She probably uh, cut a deal and she's going to make some sort of deal to give up a few people. They always go after the low hanging fruit in the pedophile world and in the child trading group. That's why, and I guess this is probably a good place to say this. I am thankful for all the churches who are getting involved now in stopping human trafficking. I'm so thankful. But what we see presented is only a very small picture because what we see presented in churches or in the media is human trafficking is these poor teenage girls were somehow snatched out of their lives here or overseas and forced into prostitution, right? Mm -hmm. That's just the tip of the iceberg. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of little children from our country that are being taken and sold overseas. We're talking about a world that's so deep in, in the trafficking of innocent ch children. And so I think the reason that the human trafficking has, they've been somewhat successful in rescuing these young ladies and I'm thankful for it, but it was like for the major group, that was like an acceptable business loss. Mm -hmm. As long as nobody got any further up the, up the ladder and started to find out who was who in the zoo and who was actually doing this so it's extremely organized it's as organized as any mafia type organization so my guess is probably just lane maxwell will cut a deal maybe a few people will take a fall she'll go away epstein will go away and now we're on to the next crisis aided by the media because in the media if it bleeds it leads so they got all the blood they could out of that story so they're gonna move on to the next one Sounds a little cynical, but that's the way the game is played. Well, no, and that's yeah. It, so the low hanging fruit is, doesn't doesn't uproot the uh, the cause. The doesn't um, even get close. Doesn't even get close. <laughs> Let's take some questions. Um, Marisa, do we have any questions? Um, I think we've got, uh, let's see, I think I see one here. Um, let's go to, oh, this wrong one. I'm sorry. Um, here, this is from our friend Felson. Should Christian parents reprimand their kids uh, to watch? I mean, I think he means to not watch or read Harry Potter. You know, that was one of the actually things, questions that I had um, on my notes tonight about uh is that the Harry Potter thing? Because there's witchcraft in there. Is that? It's real witchcraft. It's real witchcraft. Yeah, there's stuff I could take you into stuff that uh, J.K. Rowling wrote in there. That it was actually part of my training class. 
really? uh, for law enforcement. For example, there's a spell that's mentioned in Harry Potter where they found a shriveled up hand underneath a glass case and the, the occult shop man told them that's called the hand of glory. I can take you to the slide that I use for law enforcement of that very thing where they would sever the hand of a thief and put candles on the fingers and put it in the soil or in the sand while they were doing a ritual. Rowling knew her stuff and her rowling. My concern with Harry Potter is, and I've had a lot of Christian parents even say, well, it, you know, it's, it's, what's the problem? It's only fantasy. And I said, yeah, so is pornography. Do you want your kids reading that? Yeah. It, this is, it's serious in that, but the real problem is, is not the Christian kids are reading it and parents supporting it. It's that a little leaven leavens a whole loaf. And that just opened up the door into my youth group at some point. I realized not only had almost all of my kids read Harry Potter, but they were on to vampire and werewolf love stories now. And it finally occurred to me, Satan's not trying to turn them into Satanists. Satan just wants to make sure they're completely powerless in the war that we're fighting against darkness. And if they have Satan's toys in their back pocket, they're powerless. Parents really, parents really need to be aware of what their kids are doing. I remember back, maybe it was the 90s, I don't remember, Dungeons and Dragons. Was that another one that, that had some of that uh, influence or was that? There was, and uh, you know, a lot of people laughed at it later, but you know, there was at least 100 suicides of young people I knew that were directly uh, tied to the playing of Dungeons and Dragons. It was you know, done by a group called the Wizards of the West Coast and whatever, and it's really tame compared to what's in video games now. Now they have outright rituals in some of the video games. So, you know, once you let that wall down, you know, it just gets worse. So, yeah, D and D was one of the early battles that we tried to to fight. Here's a question from DJ Randy Johnson. Thanks, Greg, for sharing your powerful story. How do we keep this from happening? What should we do to combat this? Well, I think it's time to, you know, as we talked about last week, our uh, fellow warrior Carmen had passed away. And Carmen, for those of you who know about him, was a tremendous musician. And he had, he, he, he kind of laid out the temple for the fact that we're in a spiritual war. And there was a lot of churches back in the day that were teaching how to do spiritual warfare. It's not being taught hardly anywhere anymore. Paul said, we don't battle against flesh and blood, against powers and principalities and spiritual wickednesses in high places. We have to retrain church and retrain Christians how to fight the spiritual war. We cannot stop these things uh, in ourselves, in the flesh. Law enforcement can help. Uh, being aware can help. You know, it's also one of those, if you see something, say something things for sure. But ultimately, we have to battle the enemy and we have to sue him for custody of these kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, question from uh, Betty Asher, Yader, Yader Cerillo. What can we do as individuals or as a church to help child trafficking abuse? Um, There's two things. I think you can support the groups that are doing something. Mm -hmm. Make sure you vet them out. Make sure you, you they've got plenty of uh, credentials because, you know, there's can be some hinky stuff in there, too. Uh, but the other thing you can do is keep your eyes and ears open. I know here in the city I'm in, uh, I've uncovered a trafficking ring in children where they bring little children. And it's, I found out this happens in other states as well, where they'll bring a child, put it, have a child go into the restaurant, go up to a table with some candy bars and say, can you help me with my school sports program or whatever? But they're actually being trafficked. And if you see something like that, you need to ask the child, what school do you go to? And if their eyes glaze over, and they walk out, you know they're being trafficked. Make a phone call. Call 911. Tell them what's going on. They don't like this. I mean, it's I've had to pull teeth to get anybody in my city to respond to this. Even when we followed one trafficking ring for 45 minutes and called 911 and law enforcement three times, nobody ever came out. Why? But, Why won't they do anything? A couple of reasons. One is that I was told by a friend of mine in ICE, he said, look, a lot of cops just don't want to deal with it. They just don't want to be bothered. He says, the other thing is, if they arrest the child and the pimp, the child goes back across the border, and by the next day, the pimp has hired the highest price lawyer they can find, and they're out on the streets the next day. You know, money talks, people walk. That's the 
rule of thumb in the criminal world. Unbelievable. Here's a question from Ed Personius, and as full disclosure, Ed is our producer, uh, Marisa's dad. What about President Trump's executive order about human trafficking? How has that affected the issue of child trafficking and abuse? Is there a serious effort on behalf of the U.S. government to strike at the root of this problem? Well, I'm going to say this as plainly as I can. Uh, President Trump did more to strike at the heart of darkness of these groups than any president in my lifetime. And in one fell swoop, everything he, do, he did has been wiped away. Yeah. And it's criminal. Absolutely criminal. They're not thinking about, they're not thinking about the children. This whole thing about children in cages. Look, I'm on the board. And here's the reality about children being separated from their parents. Until you separate some of those children from the adults they came with, you're not going to find that. You're going to find out that a lot of these kids, the majority of these kids, they're not with their parents. They're not with their uncles. They're with a mule that's been used to bring them across the border. And so, you know, we're not thinking about the welfare of the child with all of this. It's pure, rotten politics. And shame on everybody that supported that idea. So they've pretty much buried Trump's um, uh, uh, executive order that uh, Ed was talking about. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's cut the legs out from under ICE, who actually was doing something to rescue these children from these groups. Wow. Um, just trying to see if we have some other questions here that... Uh, Marisa, did we miss anything there and uh, questions wise? It does give me for a moment for just one shameless advertisement. Yes, we please. We have a podcast called Extreme Times. Yes. Truth in the Shadowlands. So I encourage everybody to sign up for that if they. Extreme want. Times, Truth in the Shadowlands. Marisa is going to put together a little graphic. We'll pull that up. Extreme Times. Um, what was the other part of that? Truth in the Shadowlands. Yep. Okay. Um, here's a question from Dora Celia Perea. Perea. Um, aren't these kids coming with false papers? If they come with papers at all, yeah. Yeah. Borders are overloaded. I mean, people have no idea unless you're in a border situation how precarious the whole thing is. And when you mix those up with the cartels, this is dangerous. This is this is a dangerous, combustive situation. It's just absolutely overwhelming. Um, Marisa, can you put that graphic back up again? Because I want to have Greg give a website or how they how they can find that. Um, Extreme Times Truth in the Shadowlands. Greg, this is a, a podcast that you do. Yes. And how would we find that? Just um, wherever you go to find uh, whether it's Apple um, Podcasts or. I think we got Spreaker, Spotify, uh, iHeart, uh, probably a couple of others. Just look there and look for that. It's you can, that's the main way you find it. And my name is Gregory Reed, and they can find it that way. Okay, um, folks. One of the things that I think is important to know because it's really easy for people to say, "Well, what's the hope? What do you do?" And one of my uh, people I worked with in this business at some point or on the rescue effort, he says, "Don't you get tired of going after um, the little fish?" Don't you want to see some of the major players in this taken out? I said, yeah, of course. But I learned to fish you know, off my uncle's boat out of Channel Island, out in California. One of the things that I learned from that is if you get enough of the small fish and you bring them in, big fish will come in eventually. Yeah, that's true. So it's about rescuing the children, rescuing the victims. Yep, yep. Greg, in our remaining moments, what I'd like to do, because I want to give parents as much ammunition as they can to arm themselves. Um, we, we briefly went over your t what you had written as uh, called 10 ways to avoid being deceived because kids are deceived in so many different ways. But um, uh, in, in just arming parents to, to watch for some of these signs with it. But let's go over these. I'm going to have Marisa bring them up one by one, and then you could maybe expound upon them. Uh, but the first one is uh, read your Bible consistently. 
and uh, you go on to to use Second uh, Timothy to study to show thyself approved workman unto God who needs not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth certainly arming yourself with the uh, the word of truth and the armor of God is pretty self explanatory and uh, the second one is try the spirits uh, believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they be of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world which is from 1 John 4.1 um, expound on that just a little bit, if you would, Greg. Well, one of the things that uh, the sad discoveries discovery that I made is, well, we were out on the battlefield from about 86 to 2000 fighting all of this nonsense. I can't come back to a, the evangelical church in the United States that is becoming totally compromised with the occult, with new age, with yoga and you know, all this other stuff. And Christians just don't even discern or judge when you've got two or three books on the bestseller list that are so compromised with new age teaching. I realize Christians don't discern. They just, if somebody says it's from God, if it's a New York bestseller and the people say they're Christian, you know, if, if it's, it's by, sold by Zondervan or whatever, then they think it's okay. And, and I'm telling you for sure, that when Jesus talked about a great falling away, part of it is that believers don't learn to discern. You need to not just try the spirits, but test the spirits of those who want to teach in your church, those that claim to be prophets. There's a whole list of things I could go through, but we just simply need to stick to biblical truth and hold people's feet to the fire when they say, thus says the Lord. Yep. Amen. Amen, because a lot of them do say it. Question any, this is number three, question anything that seems off to you. And I guess that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, that's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Uh, number four is pray for discernment. First uh, Corinthians 12, 10, to one another, uh, to one, uh, well, you go into the, the, the uh, parting of gifts and so forth, but what, one of them is discerning of spirits. And um, that is something that, that is a gift, but also just to be praying for discernment. Uh, and these are good for parents and, and children uh, to, to be armed properly. Um, number five, don't be afraid to ask questions about the background and teaching the lifestyle of the messenger. Well, that is a big one because people are so afraid to ask anybody who's in authority but uh, that's something that can be, I mean, can reveal something very quickly. Yeah, there's a big difference between um, being critical or saying, I don't like the pastor, you know, because he has a little wart on his ear or whatever. You know, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's just ridiculous. People like that need to just stop yeah. being a big thorn in the flesh to sure. the church and to Jesus. And, but, but, there was a teaching that's been in the church at least for the last 40 years where, oh, listen, you know, you can't talk about that leader because the Bible says, touch not mine anointed. Oh, yeah, boy. My prophet, no harm. And I've seen more charlatans use that verse to carry on unbiblical things. So, you know, when, when I felt a need to confront people, because I have had to do that in even large settings, it's been very rare. And I do so in fear and trembling. But it's knowing that in humility and with the word of God, when I'm sure somebody is misleading the body of Christ, I am compelled and required by Jesus amen. to confront them. Yes, amen. Absolutely. Folks, there's nothing wrong with, with questioning authority, even in the church. Um, number five, don't be afraid to ask whether we just did that one. Um, number six. Talk things out with others. Test every spiritual, supernatural experience you see, hear, or experience for yourself. There's a lot of false um, experiences out there, aren't there? I mean, a lot of Absolutely. counterfeit. I've, I've experienced miracles. And I've also seen the counterfeit. Counterfeit looks very like the, the real thing sometimes. So I think we're required to test things that appear of a supernatural nature. Yep, test them against the Word of God, uh, and that just kind of goes back to 
to study to show thyself approved. Be on it, folks. Be on it, particularly with that. Uh, uh, number eight, um, and this is a question that you would ask. Will the person teaching be open to respond to honest questions, or will they wall you off with a brand uh, with a band uh, of handlers that keep them from talking to you? Another good point. Yeah, that was a, an issue that we had to confront in the last few years, and this would take a whole other program, but there were some very high-profile people in, in the body of Christ that were moving from one station to the next and promoting their movies and promoting all this stuff. And I knew for a fact that these people had been raised in the New Age, were committed to the New Age, and nobody was even confronting them about it. Uh, but they would not allow for anybody to get close enough to confront those things and those that supported them walled themselves off with handlers yeah. so you couldn't even get to those leaders. That's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Well, so many are, are deceived in the church even. Uh, number nine, will the teacher, prophet, apostle be willing to admit error if they are shown to be wrong? If not, you need to walk away. Absolutely great point. And that's a huge deal, especially just it recently with all the people that have this word from God that yeah. the president was going to get a second election. Mm -hmm. One of the guys repented, and then he decided, well, yeah, but now I'm going to have a, a real good podcast about how to avoid being deceived. And I'm thinking, no, you don't go from being wrong to using this to promote. And you know what? Three weeks later, he said, I should have never done that. I'm bowing out for a while. I'm like, good for you. She needs to do because if he was there during the Old Testament times, he would have been stoned. Yes, definitely. Um, and let's see, to ten, avoid persons, uh, avoid person-driven movements and people. Excellent point, Greg. Yeah, Excellent I think it's point. important to avoid uh, people-driven movements and stuff like that. Unless you want to follow me on my podcast, that's a totally <laughs> but other than that, yeah, you know, I try and avoid. Uh, you know, let's just follow Jesus, follow yes. Jesus, you know, and those that are following him. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, we've come to the top of the hour. One of the things, Greg, I think I would love to explore with you, um, because what I wanted to do is kind of go over some of the titles of your book tonight and talk about the, of your different books. Uh, but Trojan Church is something that I heard you talk about on a recent podcast. I would really love to delve into that next time we get together and, and uh, because there's so much going on even in the church today that, that I would like to explore with you. Um, but in our, on our final moments, typically what we do is kind of give an opportunity for people. And we always do if, if they want to receive Christ, that they could uh, let us know. But um, Greg, would you lead us in prayer? Um, because I just sense there's a lot of parents out there who really are not equipped or, or just really, excuse the expression, but ignorant, uh, and I mean that in a sincere way, of what's going on. And, and I would include myself in that. Um, I mean, my kids are all grown now, but um, but we had to learn something the hard way. And um, because there's even people that you trust. And I don't want to put a, a monster under every rock, but, but we need to be wise, wise people. And uh, so if you would lead us, Greg, in, in prayer as we close tonight with that. Absolutely. I'd love that. Father, thank you for the chance that we've had to share these, these very difficult truths. I thank you for Ron and his team, God, for opening up this door. Lord, and I sense that there's a lot of hearts that have been touched and even are trembling because of what we've talked about tonight, either because they've been personally touched or because... They're concerned for their own family, their kids, their grandchildren, just children in general. Lord, we confess that we don't know what we need to do to be of use to you in all of this. It seems so overwhelming. But if you've shown us a Goliath, God, truly you've got a David among us collectively, God. And I pray that every person that's heard this, God, that you would give them whatever that special thing is that they can do to make a difference in the lives of these children or rescuing these children. Give them that, Lord. If it's nothing but prayer, prayer is the most powerful thing they can do. But whatever that thing is, God, let nothing of what we talked about lead to fear or despair. Because if you show us a problem, 
you already have the solution in mind. You know what the answer is. And we know the answer is Jesus. We also know the answer is justice. We know the answer is love. We know the answer is mercy. We know the answer is bringing healing and opening of the prison door to those that are bound. Father, give everyone everything they need for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Greg. Greg, you're a good man. And I, I for one, appreciate the work that you do because it's got to be overwhelming. Uh, and to just see the, the, the vastness of all of this and sometimes just feel powerless. And uh, those who are most vulnerable among us are the ones that are being destroyed. And you're, you're walking proof of that in terms of how God redeemed you from, from that. Folks, uh, please pray for Greg and his team. Uh, they need it because, you know, when you tap into this spiritual uh, realm, there's a lot of attack that comes with it and a lot of resistance and uh, not only just spiritual, but resistance even from those uh, who were in authority, as you heard Greg talking about. Uh, please pray for them. Greg, if if folks have questions um, about uh, maybe parents have questions about these things, uh, let's let's give your website again and um, where they could reach out to you. Do we have that, Marisa, uh, that we could put up? Um, it's Youth Fire Ministries. Is it just youthfireministries.com? It's uh, actually gregoryreed.com. There it is. Greg, okay, there it is. Gregoryreed.com. What about an email address? Is there an email address that we could uh, give out? Yeah, it's legendaryseeker at gmail.com. Legendaryseeker at gmail.com. Marisa's quickly typing that up and she's going to put it up. Legendaryseeker at gmail.com. Folks, uh, you know, I, if you have sincere questions or concerns that uh, you thought that you think maybe Greg can help you with, um, uh, reach out to him at legendaryseeker uh, at gmail.com. Folks, uh, thank you for your your uh, comments tonight. I know Greg and I try to get back and uh, and answer them later after the show tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your comments. If we didn't get to your question, I'm, I'm sorry. We try to get to as many as we can. Thank you for viewing, and may God bless everyone. Greg, I'll reach out to you because I'd like to set up another thing to talk about Trojan Church. Church. Look forward to it. Thanks Thank so much. you so much, brother. I really appreciate your ministry. Thank you. God bless you. And folks, bless thank you for watching tonight. Hope you tune in next week when I interview uh, legendary singer-songwriter John Michael Talbot. We'll have some special surprises in there, too. So God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.